Emerging from stealth last year, plant breeding startup Ahalo has generated a lot of buzz with its boosted breeding technology. So what exactly is it? And why is it creating what Dave Friedberg calls a holy shit moment for breeders? You can spend many years and make very limited improvements in performance using traditional breeding techniques. And over the years, new technologies have come to market that have allowed us to be better breeders, marker-assisted breeding, doing things like quantitative genomics, um, doubled haploid uh, systems. So these technologies over time have created little bits of advantage. But it's not very often when you see that you can combine, for example, two hybrids to make a tetraploid hybrid and see the yield gain that we have seen in the crops that we've worked in where you see such a significant advancement in such a short period of time. So we think that boosted breeding is just such a tremendous unlock. We really feel it's almost, I mean, it's funny, we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of hybrid breeding. We think it is almost as significant in terms of the impact it could have. And importantly, it can have the impact not just on a limited set of crops, but on pretty much all crops. What we do with boosted at Ohalo is we turn meiosis into mitosis. So meiosis is the process by which sex cells are made, sperm and egg. And typically, a sex cell is made through meiosis as a process of recombination of the two sets of chromosomes in the parent plant down to one. And that fusion that happens in meiosis happens at random points where the two chromosomes intersect. And that is why every sperm is genetically distinct and why every egg is genetically distinct. And that's why when you cross two parents together, you have siblings that are all genetically different. They're back to having two chromosomes, but they have a different half of the genes from the mother, a different half from the father. So what we do is we turn off the genes that control for meiosis and basically sex cells are produced through mitosis. So now the sperm are all identical. They have the complete genome of the father and the egg are all identical. They have the complete genome of the mother. So when you cross two parent plants that have been boosted, you end up creating offspring that are genetically identical, which means all the seed is identical. So we can now make seed in crops that are traditionally vegetatively propagated, like potato, and we can make seed that can go in the ground that's genetically uniform. And you now have the entire genome of the mother, the entire genome of the father, so you can stack all the traits together, Increase. Rather than getting a kind of random... Random a selection from each parent, yeah. that's right. Okay, okay. Yeah. I've seen some kind of online comments when you first launched about this saying, is this new? Can we also induce polyploidy by using chemicals and so on? Yeah. Can you just place it in context? Yeah, so inducing polyploidy is mm. a technique that's been used in breeding where you basically double the number of chromosomes, but they're copies. Mm -hmm. So you can use a technique using a chemical like colchicine, which mm. you can apply, and then you get two copies of each chromosome that get induced in the cell rather than just the original uh, single copy of each chromosome. And so that's used for different breeding techniques. What we're doing, it's not just about doubling the polyploidy, it's about stacking an entire genome from a mother, an entire genome from a father. So you get two distinct pairs of chromosomes that you now combine. So you now have a polyploid or tetraploid offspring that's the combination of the mother and the father rather than a doubling of the mother or a doubling of the father. So polyploidy is used in some of these breeding techniques, but it's unrelated to what we're doing here where we're creating a polyploid output, but we're making uniform seed and we can do an entirely novel breeding process with it. So what are the key benefits of this boosted breeding approach then? You just got a more rapid and predictable way of getting the traits you want? Precisely. So yeah. there's uh, three benefits. Yeah. One is precision breeding. So you can mm -hmm. control what you're putting together and you get exactly the combination of the mother and the father. Mm -hmm. So you can stack traits mm -hmm. and you know what you're going to get when you make a cross. You don't make a cross and get a random assortment of thousands of seed, each of which you have to plant and yes. genotype or phenotype to figure out what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. The second benefit mm -hmm. is you can make true seed because mm -hmm. you're, every seed will now have mm -hmm. the exact same genetics, mm -hmm. you can make seed in crops where we can't actually use seed and it's very difficult or impossible to inbreed and do hybridization. Mm -hmm. And the third benefit is higher yields. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that when you make selections from distinct parents that have very different genes or very different alleles, mm -hmm. the yield goes through the roof. This process is called, or this feature is called heterosis. It's what we see when we do hybrid plant breeding two inbreds that are different enough, when you put them together, the hybrid offspring has very enhanced yield over either parent. And so by increasing the number of unique genes, you end up having a pretty um, significant boost in yield. And we've seen that conserved across every crop we've okay. worked on. Okay, so which crops uh, are you focusing on first with this technology? We've publicly talked about potato and strawberry at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but really potato is the one that we've kind of been been kind of, strawberry is actually a little bit of a different hybrid breeding technique than boosted. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but in Potato, we're using Boosted. And so I think Potato is a pretty significant opportunity. It's the third largest source of calories on Earth today, 45 million acres globally. And you have to put 10% of the biomass in the field to get the yield out that you end up. So it's about a 10 to 1 multiplication. That's In the US, that means we're moving four tons of plant material per acre into the field. That requires a lot of labor, a lot of fuel, a lot of fungicide, a lot of fumigation, a lot of time, a lot of cost. So if we can move to true seed, where literally a, a handful of seed can seed many acres, um, we can radically transform the economics, reduce the fungicide, improve the sustainability, improve the economics for the farmer. And, and we think over time that will actually translate into not just better economics for the farmer, but actually more acres mm -hmm. and more calorie production. Potato is an extraordinary calorie producer. Mm -hmm. And so if we can move to true seed and get global adoption, uh, it's going to be pretty transformative. And what is your business model? Making seed and selling seed. OK, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. um, you recently announced the world's first self-pollinating nonpareil almond variety. Historically, nonpareil almonds are the highest quality most valuable almond trees. So about 40% of the planted acres, 40 to 50% of the planted acres are non-pareil trees. Mm -hmm. Farmers, they make big, delicious, crunchy almonds and they make very high yields. So farmers prefer them, they get a price premium, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. But it cannot fertilize itself. So you need these pollinizer trees yeah. that ultimately reduce the profitability. You have different harvest cycles. You have a cost of bringing in bees to do all the pollination, etc. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we altered the non pareil tree to make mm -hmm. it self-compatible mm -hmm. so it can now fertilize itself. Mm -hmm. As a result, you can plant an entire orchard mm -hmm. with just our fruition one tree mm -hmm. and you will now benefit from one harvest, fewer bees, less water per almond produced, mm -hmm. higher gross profit, uh, lower operating costs, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, this will ultimately be better for the farmer, for the planet, for the consumer. For those, non, for those pollinator trees that were historically planted, do they have just um, less valuable almonds on them then. That's right. So yeah. traditional pollinizer trees that yeah. are used with nonpareils, yeah. um, lower yield and lower value per right. pound. They're actually a lower quality almond. Yes. Okay. And so uh, they're, they're not as good, mm -hmm. plus all the bee cost, plus the, the cost of running two harvests. And, and remember, mm -hmm. this, this is not a boosted breeding program. Mm -hmm. This is um, a, an alteration we did with the genes yes. that are responsible for self-compatibility. Mm -hmm. And we did this as a, uh, you know, kind of one of our early products before we had our boosted breeding system working. Right. So now that we have boosted breeding working, our key focus at Ohalo is on producing seed for crops that are traditionally vegetatively propagated. Okay, so what does that mean for the almond work then? Is that kind of on the back burner then? Oh no, we're scaling. Yeah. That, that okay. is off to market. That's, right. uh, we have a nursery partner, Sierra Gold, yeah. that is mul busy multiplying trees, taking orders and trying to get uh, commercial uh, release done. How do you know that this new variety is reliable? Doesn't it take years before almond trees start? You can actually see mm -hmm. results in um, a very juvenile stage. So okay. we can phenotype this very early on and we already have our trial orchards okay. uh, planted and we'll be able to have demos for yeah. farmers in the, um, in the hopefully in the next year or so. And what about the regulatory status of this technology? Yeah, so this uses one of several new breeding techniques that mm -hmm. um, because you're not introducing foreign DNA uh -huh. into the plant, mm -hmm. you're effectively either turning a gene on or off mm -hmm. that's already native mm -hmm. uh, to the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a very kind of limited to no regulatory um, process uh, in many markets, including mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, crops that are vegetatively propagated. You mentioned potatoes and you talked about strawberries. This week mm -hmm. we announced a partnership with several of the leading grower packer marketers in the strawberry industry. Mm -hmm. Very kind of forward thinking consortium of members that are helping to contribute mm -hmm. capital and fund the breeding and true seed development work we're doing. So we're mm -hmm. running um, a hybrid breeding program in strawberry. It's being mm -hmm. run by Phil Stewart. Phil spent the last 17 years running the strawberry breeding program for Driscoll's. Yeah. He joined us to run our strawberry breeding program because obviously he has seen what we are able to do mm -hmm. and he's very excited to, to partner with us on, uh, on bringing this, uh, these, this program to, to market. So ultimately the objective is to make hybrid true seed and strawberry. This will change the economics in the strawberry industry today. Farmers have to use a traditional vegetative propagation system in nurseries to take a new variety to market. It can take quite some time and some capital. There's a lot of risk in keeping all that biomass around, so you have to use uh, a lot of applications uh, uh, to keep um, pest and disease at bay. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately it can be a little bit more expensive to go to market than if we can create an automated planting system. Um, and then there's also other features during the growing season uh, that will benefit from the true seed system in terms of labor costs. So significantly reduce labor cost in the field. 
significantly faster time to deployment of new varieties and significantly improve quality of the phenotype in the varieties from a consumer perspective, which is flavor and taste yeah, and nutrition. Yeah, I was going to ask what traits are you actually yeah. interested in? in so so we, we think about the whole supply chain. And, mm. and historically, strawberry breeding has required making a lot of trade-offs. In order to have good shelf life, we've taken maybe some flavor out of the strawberry. Um, in order to have good yield, maybe the strawberries you know, don't look as good or taste as good. And so this trade-off between the farm, yeah. retail, supply chain, packers, and the consumer has always been kind of the, the breeding challenge in strawberry. So with our system, we can very precisely control when you combine two parents, you get a hybrid offspring. So we know what we're gonna get in the offspring. And so then we can use genomic selection models to determine which parents we wanna to put together to produce the offspring. And that means we can now start to stack phenotypes that are beneficial to the consumer, taste better, more nutritious, good for the retailer, longer shelf life, and good for the farmer lower operating costs, faster deployment, et cetera. So that's the key kind of set of objectives for our program. And really importantly, this is an open access program. So this is not like traditionally in, in certain breeding programs, it's closed, only members get to access varieties. We're bringing the seed to market for everyone. And so while we have members in the consortium with us today, they're helping to fund and do field trials and provide advice and so on. Ultimately, the seed comes to market, it's gonna be available to growers and companies all over the world um, and we hope that this will really benefit the industry.